Welcome to Sunday Morning Worship at Our Savior's Lutheran Church in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Our Savior's is a congregation of people forgiven in Christ whose mission is to proclaim the good news and connect faith to everyday life. We are glad you have chosen to worship with us on this eighth Sunday after Pentecost. Our contemporary worship will begin in a few moments. on this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful day. What's the temperature outside? The same as the... Oh, we'll be fine. We'll be fine. Gene is predicting. Gene is predicting we will be just fine here in a little bit. So we'd like to welcome you all, especially those of us uh, who are uh, welcoming guests and, uh, and uh, visitors to uh, our saviors and uh, those of us who are joining on our, our Facebook Live broadcast today. A special welcome to you folks. Right now, if you will, please stand for the call to worship. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord and bless his holy name. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Come, let us worship the Lord. Oh, for a thousand. Oh, for a thousand tongues 
Good morning, our saviors. I'm Pastor Justin. It's great to have you here. I feel the cool air starting to blow a little bit. Do you? All right, good. All right, let's begin with prayer. Oh God, the truth that is in our world is riddled with sin and injustice. Your people suffer while their oppressors live lives of comfort and excess. But through your son, it is also true that we have hope in your promises and in the ultimate victory of life over death. Help us to hold tight to that hope in spite of all the world would draw us away from you. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, we pray. Amen. Well, now, my friends, I invite you to remain standing, actually, because we're going to continue worship with our trip blessing for our kids that are heading out now. So if, uh, if you are going on this trip, why don't you join us right down here in the front as we hear a word from John. Yeah, come on. And the reason I want all of you to stand is because I want you wonderful people to join hands. And then we want to invite the rest of the congregation to join hands or put a hand on a shoulder. Could scoot down this way a little bit for me. Go into the middle of the congregation. There we go. This is fine. Just take a shoulder or a hand of someone who's by you. And congregation, lean on in on this so that everyone can get close and we can pray a prayer of blessing on these people who are heading out to Minneapolis. Here a reading from the Gospel of John. When Jesus and his disciples had finished eating, Jesus asked 
Simon, son of John, do you love me more than the others do? And Simon Peter answered, yes, Lord, you know that I do. Then feed my lambs, Jesus said. Jesus asked a second time, Simon of John, do you love me? Peter answered, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus told him. Jesus asked a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus had asked him three times if he loved him. So Jesus told him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus replied, feed my sheep. Travelers, will you accept this commission to love God by serving God's people, to carry it out in accordance with the Holy Scriptures, to feed God's sheep? If so, if so say, I will, with God's help. I will, with God's help. Will you work hard to act as examples and servants of Jesus Christ? If so, say, I will, with God's help. I will, with God's help. Will you be compassionate, patient, forgiving? and loving to people among whom you will live and work. If so, say, I will with God's help. I will with God's help. Almighty God, who has given you the, the will to do these things, will graciously give you the strength and compassion to perform them. And you people of God, will you support these messengers of Jesus Christ, sent by God to serve God's people with the gospel of hope and grace? Will you pray for them, help and Honor them for their work's sake, and in all things strive to live in peace and unity with Christ. If so, say, we will. We will. Let's pray. Gracious God, you have called this group to a special ministry. Please bless them with traveling mercies as they go to Minneapolis today. Please give them a safe journey. Be with them as they build relationships with each other and with you, God. We ask your blessings on the Week of Hope staff and the red shirts. Strengthen this group with your spirit and bless them that through their work, your love and grace might be shared. Amen. Amen. All right, you can return to your seats. And our worship continues with the reading of scripture. People, God, you may be seated. We hear God's voice in the Bible and in preaching, in music and prayer. Listen for God's voice in these readings. The first is found in Amos. This is what the Lord God has shown me. The Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, see, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass them by. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with a sword. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to King Jeroboam of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you. In the very center of the house of Israel, the land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile away from this land. And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go. Flee away to the land of Judah. Earn your bread there and prophecy there. But never again prophecy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary and it is the temple of the kingdom. Then Amos answered Amaziah, I am no prophet, nor a prophet's son, but I am a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore trees. And the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go, prophecy to my people Israel. Word of God, word of life. <clears throat> The second reading is found in the Gospel of Mark. King Herod heard of the disciples preaching, for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead, and for this reason these powers are at work in him. But others said, it is Elijah. And yet others said, it is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, 
John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him, and put him in prison on account of um, Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him, but she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he heard John, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, ask me for whatever you wish and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, whatever you ask me, I will give you, even half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, what should I ask for? She replied, the head of John the baptizer. Immediately, she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was deeply grieved, yet out of regard for his oaths and for his guests, he did not want to refuse her. So immediately, the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. Word of God, word of life. When uh, Jackie just stepped away, she said, oh, that's a tough one. It's true. This is a terrible story, and there is literally no gospel in it. We start off with Herod. What can we say about him? Herod was called a king in Mark's gospel, but he was actually no king at all. He shared the job with three others, even though he wanted to be the only one. He was really more of a governor than anything else. And even more, his authority was not real in any way that actually matters. He served at the pleasure of Rome, a mere puppet, and the emperor, his puppet master. And if there was ever a dispute between Herod and the emperor, the emperor won every time. As a man, the picture doesn't really get any prettier. Herod was a vapid, jealous, and impulsive man. His wife, well, really his second wife, Herodias, was actually his brother's wife first. And if that feels wrong to you, then you have got it right. Not only that, for Herodias was actually also his niece. Yeah, that's the kind of so-called king we are talking about here. A vapid, jealous, impulsive, wife-stealing, niece-marrying, puppet king. Just the kind of leader we would all want to respect and follow. Herod, ironically, in spite of himself, actually felt drawn to the prophet John the Baptist. And even though John spoke truth to power, condemning Herod's wife-stealing, niece-marrying, repugnant ways, Herod was interested in what John had to say. All the while, however, Herodias despised John and wanted him dead. So Herod protected him. Well, Herod kept him in protective custody in prison, but that was the compromise they came to to keep him alive. John was a threat to Herodias because John refused, but Herod refused to kill John because he thought John had something important to say. And Herodias would have to wait for her opportunity to put an end to John and his troublemaking ways. But this opportunity came at Herod's birthday party. Imagine what a lavish celebration such a vapid, jealous, impulsive, wife-stealing, niece-marrying puppet king would throw for himself. 
hundreds of guests, copious amounts of food and drink, music, dancing, and every kind of immorality and excess all out in the open. And even his daughter joined in before her bedtime, dancing for her father and his guests. And let's just say this wasn't a sweet, youthful dance a la Shirley Temple or the Von Trapp children. Mark tells us it pleased Herod, which if this sounds wrong to you, you have got it right. He could have thanked her and sent her to bed, but no. He impulsively reacts with an over-the-top offer to show off to his guests. Like any mature, secure, respectable leader would do, he says, I'll give you anything you want up to half my kingdom, he promises the little girl. Maybe he expected her to make the request of a little girl, a pony or a doll or a dollhouse, a new dress or an iPhone. But no. It almost seems that her conniving mother prepared her for a moment like this because she goes straight to Herodias and received her mother's instructions. Ask for the head of John the Baptist. There was no turning back for Herod. He had made this offer in front of his daughter, and not only that, but all of his esteemed guests, and to back out would have been shameful and embarrassing to him. Now, to be clear, a better man might have been able to get out of it, and a better man would have never made that kind of offer, but Herod was not a better man. A vapid, jealous, impulsive, wife-stealing puppet king, he was trapped. And he the king submitted to a little girl's request to have the prophet of the Lord executed. So Herod ordered that John be killed, and he was. The end. That's the story. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. So like I said at the beginning, there is no gospel in this story. There's no silver lining. There's no redeeming it. It's not okay that any of this happened, and it's not the way that things are supposed to be. But these days, when we hear this story about this vapid, jealous, selfish, impulsive puppet king and the tragic, far-reaching results of his actions, we can't help but compare this story to the ones that we see in the 24-hour news cycle in our news feeds, Twitter feeds, newspaper, and on the radio. And it's, it's disgusting. C. Clifton Black drew my attention to a Washington Post article that quotes a lavishly paid lobbyist who confessed, there are only two engines that drive Washington. One is greed, and the other is fear. Greed and fear. And I hardly need to explain where our nation is headed when those two things are in the driver's seat. Here's an example using the immigration debate. Instead of focusing on our shared values and history, when trying to cut down on illegal immigration and its related problems, our divided government and media would have us operate only in extremes. This promotes fear of the other and it pushes everyone engaged in the debate further and further apart where proximity and dialogue would promote kindness, grace, and compromise, greed and fear allow only for the loudest, most extreme voices to be heard. And not only this, but this vitriol has prevented families from being reunited, separated, um, and it's separated help and safe sanctuary from those who really do need it, and in turn, it has ruined and endangered lives. There are other, better ways to deal with the problems we are facing, but with greed and fear in the lead, they just don't stand a chance. This is not a problem we can blame on Democrats or Republicans or Americans, Guatemalans or North Koreans or black, brown or white people or police or military or civilians. This is a problem that comes when sin is in the driver's seat. And I don't think that I need to work too hard at making the point that it most certainly has been and is now. And as long as there are people in power over others, sin will be close by. And again, there is no gospel in any of this either. There's no redeeming it. There's no silver lining. It's not the way things are supposed to be, and it's not okay. This week, our gospel reading, not unlike our news feed, offers no good news at all. 
So I think at this point, you're feeling like you haven't learned anything new compared to what you came in with. Are you ready for some good news, though? Okay. Well, in this story of John's beheading, not unlike the Good Friday story of Jesus' crucifixion, the gospel good news can only be found outside of the story in the hope of what comes next. You see, after this story about Herod's birthday feast, there is another banquet with a different host. This one, however, comes on a hillside with 5,000 nobodies and women and children. There's no wine and no table, just five loaves and two fish donated by a little boy from his lunchbox prepared by his parents. This meal, however, gives life. And at the banquet that Jesus hosts, promises are made. Promises of freedom from oppression, hunger, sickness, and suffering for all. And these promises give life. And at the end, everyone is full and there are more leftovers than anybody knows what to do with. And the baskets are so full and so are everyone's bellies. And after Jesus' meal, everyone who came is filled and full in spirit, mind, and in body. The good news that I have for you today is not that bad leaders get exposed and put to shame, though they do. It's not even that a vapid, jealous, impulsive wife stealing niece marrying puppet king cannot thwart God's purposes, though we can't. Like most of Mark's gospel, the point, the good news, is that true authority and power do not belong to the so-called puppet kings and queens and presidents and lawmakers and celebrities. Rather, true power and authority belong to Jesus Christ alone, the one true king. We do not have to live in obedience to anybody else, and no one else can promise what Jesus can. And if anybody tries, they're a liar. Furthermore, what Jesus promises us in our baptism cannot be cheapened or taken away, not ever, and not by anybody. John knew this. Amos knew it. But John knew this. That's why he was able to tell Herod that his marriage to Herodias was not faithful, even though he knew that it put his life in jeopardy. But John didn't answer to Herod's false authority. His allegiance belonged to Jesus alone. This didn't make an easy life for him. He lived a life of poverty and isolation. He was imprisoned and eventually executed. But he was free in every way that matters, and he belonged to no one but Jesus. He, allowed, he owed nothing to anybody else, and he knew that all he had belonged to him. And when you know that, it changes everything. This story, though it is not good news, tell the, the truth about our sinful world. We recognize our world and our so-called leaders in it. But as David Lose insists, there is a second truth that lies outside of this story. And that truth is that God is writing us and is writing us into a better story than we deserve or can imagine. The second truth is that God is writing us into a story of love and life to change and redeem our world of greed and fear. That God is using us to write a story of love and life. And under the authority of Jesus, there is life, and there is enough for everyone, and all will be healed and whole. Thanks be to God.
in a God who is more powerful than all the powers of this world, who works in every age to show justice and light and truth. And believing in this God, trusting in the promises of this God, we confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. As we grow in faith and discipleship, we give thanks to God for God's merciful compassion. And so this is how we can pray for our church and our world and ourselves. Please pray with me today. God of truth, put your word of justice on our lips. Bless your church in the task of ministry and mission, and make us a sign of your righteousness and your loving kindness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of faithfulness, we give you thanks for the gifts of ministry and mission we share here at Our Savior's Lutheran. We thank you for summer worship and gatherings, for youth groups and camps, for mission trips, and all our opportunities to grow in our faith. Be with our, young, our youth and adult leaders as they head to Minneapolis this week for their mission trip. Keep them safe and healthy. Fill them with your spirit as they go to serve and learn. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of salvation, bring wholeness to all your beloved children. Anoint the hands of all the caregivers, nurses, doctors, therapists, hospice workers, and chaplains who cook for our sick friends. Bring abundance of life to all who long for healing. We especially pray for the hospitalized, including Hugo Waterick, David Knudsen, Sharon Schulte, David Unziker, Bob Matson, Shirley Reinholdt, and those we name in our hearts before you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of tenderness, you adopt us as your very own. Help us to provide nourishing care for all the children in our midst. Inspire us with their creativity and energy. Bless Odin, Michael, Michael Schoenfelder, and Claire Sue Stearns as we celebrate with them in their baptisms this weekend. May they grow in their understanding of your love for them throughout the years. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
God of the saints, you have claimed all the faithful departed as your own and given them a great inheritance in glory. Sustain us in faith until the fullness of time when you gather up all things in heaven and earth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, we give you all these prayers and the prayers of our hearts. And we trust in your everlasting love and mercy. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now, having asked God to work in the world, let us invite God to change our hearts with a time of confession. God of mercy and grace, hear us as we come before you now to confess our sins against you and one another, so we may hear your words of forgiveness and turn from our sinful ways. Gracious God, we confess to you the many times we have sinned in thought, word, and deed. We have not always loved you as we ought, and we have not loved each other as you have commanded us to do. We seek to be the God of our own lives and falsely believe that we know what is better for us than you do. Our pride, our selfishness, our self-centered ways have come between us and you. We seek your forgiveness, Lord, and we pray that you would guide us anew by your grace. people of God before you even spoke these words, God's grace was at work in you to bring the forgiveness and peace that only God can give. It is by God's command and by God's great love for you that I declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. Live in the newness of God's grace and love and all God's people said, thanks be to God. Peace of Christ be with you all. And also with you. Now, as we gather the great gifts that God has given us, I want to invite our little kids to come up and partake of the noisy offering. Our offering will now be received.
God is perfect in all of God's ways. So it is a very good thing that when God gathered with friends in the person of Jesus, God gave us a feast to celebrate, a way that we would know how different God's ways were from the ways of this world. In the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, and he broke it, and he gave thanks for it, and he gave it to all of his friends, and he said, take this and eat, for this is my body given for you. Do this to remember me. Later that evening, he took a cup, and he gave thanks for it, and he gave it for all of his friends to drink, and he said, this cup is the new covenant, the new promise of forgiveness, my blood shed for you and for all people, hope for the world. Do this to remember me. With this bread and this cup, we know that God is here, that God is good, and so we may be too. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. All are welcome at this table where God is love and God is shared. Sinners who have been redeemed, 
Sing that third verse again. Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you to go into the world shining as a light, a light of change and hope and peace and goodness, where there's no room for fear and no room for greed. Lord be with you.
It's been great to worship here with you today. This, we're now eight Sundays after Pentecost. It feels like a million years ago. And we are so glad that all of you are here with us. Let me tell you about a couple things happening in our community this week. So in just a couple weeks, July 29th, 1145 a.m. in the gathering place, we have a meeting of the Our Savior's Lutheran congregation. The agenda is our normal mid-year financial update and some other information. So if that sounds fun to you, you are invited to attend. <laughs> hey, someone's, it's someone's thing, Sammy. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and we'll be there for sure. So come join us because we will. You know the thing that's great about talking about um, about this. It doesn't sound like it's actually that fun, but but what it means is that we get to check in on on how that we use the things of this world, like dollars and cents and time and uh, other things that come in limited resources, and we turn them into stories about how God's work is changing lives in this world. So that's actually what you can come and hear a little bit about in a couple weeks on July 29th. You'll also notice in your bulletin an insert detailing information on an Eagle Scout project that's currently underway by our Savior's Lutheran member, Zach Carlson. On the insert, you're going to find information on how you can support Zach. His Eagle Scout project is pretty cool. It's to collect instruments and to give them to the school to refurbish them and give them to schools for their music programs so you might have a flute or a trumpet or a timpani laying around your house and in that case you can uh, find out a little bit more about that and zach will be here next week to tell us a little bit more about that project in person this week our summer organ recital continues on wednesday beginning at 12 15 p.m in the sanctuary followed by a light lunch in the gathering place there are organists from all over this region coming to play the beautiful instrument that we have in the sanctuary. And you're all invited to come. That's at 1215 this Wednesday at, in the sanctuary. And also just continue to pray for these youth and adult leaders as they go on their trip for, to, to Minneapolis this week. Uh, there's, um, it's going to be an incredible week of hope for them. And uh, please pray for them and the staff and the city that they may see the light of God at work in their midst. Okay, now I invite you to stand as I give you God's blessing and send you out into the world. Go forth, children of God, to share the good news you have heard this day. We go forth to love and serve in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. And thanks be to the guy who got it cool in here by 915. Did I, did I not Woo! say 915? Everybody on three say, thank you, Lloyd. One, two, three. Thank, thank you, Lloyd. And then, I, hey, I wish I could thank the person who wrote this next song, because it's really a great song that we're going to end with. Oh, I can. He's right there. Good job, Denny. Let's do it today. Five counts. Yeah. Make disciples of all the world. Show the people the way. Spread the word of his precious love. And do it today. Feed the hungry and help Work for justice and righteousness And do it today Have compassion on those who are needy And love in your heart Preach the gospel to all creation Thank you for joining us in worship at Our Savior's Lutheran Church in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. 
For more information about our saviors, please visit our website at oslchurch.com. We invite you to join us again next Sunday morning. Until next time, may God's abundant love and blessings empower you to share the good news of Jesus Christ.